Ashok Subramanian believes that primary care is the key to affordable, high-quality health care. That's really not a unique insight. In fact, all the lower-cost, high-performing systems outside the U.S. have robust primary care, but it's awfully hard to put it in practice in the U.S. Centivo, where Ashok is CEO, offers a primary care-focused plan to private employers. Centivo encourages employees to develop deep primary care relationships, and they reward providers for achieving strong clinical and cost-effectiveness goals. Ashok is a diehard fan of his native Buffalo, New York, where a diverse and highly educated workforce is a key success factor for Centivo. In his spare time, he reads heavy books like Deaths of Despair and lighter ones like The Game. I'm David Williams, host of the Health Biz Podcast and president of Health Business Group, a strategy consulting firm that helps companies like Centivo develop robust growth plans. Reach out to me, dwilliams at healthbusinessgroup.com to discuss strategy for your company. And while you're at it, please remember to subscribe to the Health Biz Podcast on your favorite service. Ashok Subramanian, CEO of Centivo, welcome to the Health Biz Podcast. Thank you, uh, David. Appreciate you having me and it's great to be here. It's good. Listen, I'm very interested to hear all about what you're doing with Centivo, but I want to hear a little bit how you got there as well. And maybe just starting with your, your upbringing, any you know childhood influences that have stuck with you, uh, you know, to this day. I, I don't want to. I don't want to. You know, bring up any difficult things from your childhood. So anything positive, uh, you know, that that may have been a help. Yeah. Well, if we can't talk about the difficult things, this will be very short. Um, okay. But uh, no, David. You know, the, I think the quick strokes. I, I grew up in in Buffalo. I'm pretty loyal to. Uh, to Western New York, upstate New York. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, you know, grew up in a family of immigrants, uh, several of whom are in the healthcare profession. And I think like a lot of people went to school uh, thinking that maybe I'll be pre-med or something like that, uh, got exposure to different things, decided to go more into the business side of healthcare. And uh, I spent five and a half years as a consultant with McKinsey. Uh, I got the startup bug uh, when I spent a couple of years on the West Coast in, in business school. And didn't know what to do with it at the time, so went back to McKinsey. But, uh, you know, finally got some inspiration in my early 30s, started a company called Liaison, and sort of that's been the entry into healthcare startups and, you know, everything that I think we're going to talk about today. No, that sounds uh, that sounds very good. Well, I won't press you too much on the uh, on the childhood. I will say I'm a fan of upstate uh, New York or western New York as you get over toward the, uh, toward the Buffalo area. And I think a lot of people that, uh, you know, are, are from there, grew up there, appreciate, you know, kind of the... The lifestyle, all the benefits uh, that you have, and there's not as much sex appeal to those on the outside, but they are they're missing out. Well, I'll give you one stat, uh, which is twenty in twenty uh, in the in the 2010s, in the past decade, it was the first decade in 70 years that we added population. Uh, we grew in in Buffalo, in, in Erie County, which is the county, in, in Western New York. Um, a lot of that growth, um, which people may not know, is due to new Americans to immigrants from Asia, from Africa, from Latin America. So while it has the Rust Belt ethos and brand from say the 1950s, 60s, 70s, um, it really has turned a corner um, into a very diverse, very um, cosmopolitan, though smaller town, uh, mid-sized uh, city. You know, where I do uh, a lot of business in, in Rochester, New York, uh, which has some of the similar characteristics and have been involved with uh, companies that are, you know, very innovative and big job creators with founders from, you know, Finland, Ukraine, Russia, Poland, France, um, working with people from Thailand, the UK. So it's very dynamic. Um, and uh, I mean, one of the things, uh, this isn't about this podcast, but, you know, one of the, the dynamism of the, of the US, it definitely comes from uh, immigration. And I think if we forget about where all the jobs are actually created, uh, from then we're, we're going to find ourselves in a in, in a bad spot. So always happy to hear somebody who kind of personifies uh, from your family, um, you know that that experience. Yeah, no, absolutely, and and little things, you know, the big things like uh, I think the stat was over half of companies in Silicon Valley were started by by immigrants, but uh, on the other end of the spectrum, um, back to uh, back to my hometown, uh, there's a you know, beautiful sort of space called the West Side Bazaar, which are artisans and craftspeople and food vendors and restaurants. 
again, many of these are refugees from, you know, Afghanistan and Burma and, and uh, you know, people who came over on boats uh, from, from Vietnam. It's, it's, it's really incredible to see. So I know you wanted to zip right past McKinsey, but since I'm a career consultant and you know, still stuck with it, I want to dwell on that for, for a minute. Um, you know, what sort of – what was your experience like that? And, and maybe more importantly, what – did you pick up skills there that are still important today or was it something, okay, you checked the box and then found what you really wanted to do? Yeah, no doubt. I, I, David, I'm a big fan and, and, and you know, consultants have uh, mixed reputations and deservedly so. And McKinsey certainly has gotten the best press um, in certain quarters over the last few years. Um, but, you know, there are tremendous learning opportunities to be a consultant um, at various points in your career, particularly early in your career. You know, I think two or three specific things. One is, you simply get more exposure to a broader array of people, problems, situations as a consultant because you change projects, you know, every few months versus if you join a company. And I think that level of exposure and the pattern recognition um, is valuable. You know, I think the second is there's there's the stereotype of a hey, McKinsey only does work with C CEOs. You know, that's not actually true, but you do get more exposure to senior people than you deserve to. Uh, as a lowly 22-year-old analyst, as I certainly deserve to as a lowly 22-year-old yeah. analyst. And again, you see how they behave, how they comport themselves, how they make decisions, the types of information they look for. Um, and so by no means are, you know, were we as 22-year-old analysts the peer counselors for CEOs, but it's a window into that world that is otherwise, again, very hard to come by. And then I think the third is this relentless focus on data and analysis over emotion. It is something um, the business community, I think, has gotten better at. And, you know, even in you know, football teams and baseball teams and everyone's using analytics these days. But the ability to really always step back and say, where, where are the facts? Where does the data take you? Not based on loyalty, not based on emotion, not based on what might have worked 10 years ago. And that is, again, a very healthy mental toolkit to approach the business world with um, early in your career, I, I would say. Now, talk a little bit about liaison because there was, um, you know, it was, it was part of a very big concept at that point about, you know, exchanges and how the employers are getting involved in, in new forms of healthcare. But what was that era like and, you know, what, what happened to that concept eventually? Yeah, it's pretty fascinating. It's a, it's a great window into innovation in healthcare and benefits in, in a lot of ways. So, you know, look, in 2007, when we started Liaison, it certainly was not a, we're going to take the world over and there's going to be a thing called a private exchange. And I, I maybe some people knew that somebody named Barack Obama was a senator in, you know, from Illinois, was going to run for president and was going to win and was going to create these ACA public exchanges, you know, which created some of the inspiration uh, around at least the phrase private exchange. But our view was very simple, which is that employee benefits had really not been innovated since the UAW and General Motors got together and said, we should give people pensions and we should give people health care because Congress put wage and price controls in place after World War II. And over, you know, in the 60 years uh, since that point at that time, and now it's, you know, 75 years, the workforce has become increasingly diverse. People don't join a company at the age of 18 and leave at the age of 64. They hop every two and a half years. Um, and the and, and in other products and services in society, whether it's shopping online for books or TVs or whatever, we have now embraced the concept of personalization. So liaison was at its core about enabling personalization in the area of group benefits, using technology as a means to do that. And in that way, it's become incredibly successful. So table stakes in the world of benefit enrollment administration platform are now some level of decision support, navigation, offering an array of choices, the, the surge in voluntary benefits from you know, critical illness insurance to pet insurance and everything in between. I really think liaison was incredibly instrumental in driving the technology and the personalization and the digitization of that process. What didn't happen which I think was a little bit overblowing from various folks in the industry, 
was this concept that every company in, in America would adopt a multi-carrier exchange model for their health insurance. And through that, there would be, you know, more competition and lower prices and lower healthcare costs. That certainly an important goal and a noble goal and why we're here at Centivo, and we'll get into that. But that was never really the goal of liaison. The goals that liaison set out to do, I think, in a lot of ways um, have been accomplished. So now let's talk about uh, Centivo, of course, where you are now as, as CEO, and just ask about, you know, after all you had observed from McKinsey and then certainly from Liaison, you know, why was this the right direction? Why health insurance and, and why the emphasis on, on primary care uh, as well? Yeah, no, those are the right questions, David. And, and I'm going to actually add a question, kind of even going one step upstream, which is after five and a half years of McKinsey and after you know seven years at Liaison and a couple of years at the at the parent company at Willis Towers Watson, um, why jump back on the horse? And uh, startups are really hard and they, they never get easier. Um, but to me, there was, there continues to be this enduring issue of healthcare affordability. It is getting worse, not better. The average American, and David, you certainly know, and your listeners you know, may know the, the data, but you know, the average American has $400 in their bank account for any emergency and is now confronting a deductible of about $2,500. The, the math simply doesn't work. And as industry people, we all know the money is there. there there's enough money if you were to get people to the right providers, drive better utilization, negotiate the you know, best costs in market, the money is there to lower costs substantially, double digits or more, and offer nearly free health care to the average American, but the incentives are broken. And so the first sort of piece of this was, can we actually add value? Is there a business here to add value? Can we make a difference in the lives of people who literally are choosing between you know, food, housing, and medicine on a day-to-day -day basis? So took about a year to think about if is is that the right thing to do uh and and the blood and the sweat and the tears that have to go into that and 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 the answer of course since we're all here is is yes to your point then about health insurance and primary care it became clear to us that while many have attempted to steer care using advocacy models or transparency tools on top of an existing network infrastructure they, they simply, they, they may help on the margin, but they simply don't work to drive the large amounts of waste and inefficiency that need to be taken out to achieve that affordability mission. So that took us to the need for a full stack health plan. And the focus on primary care candidly is every single survey and the most, most recently the report from the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine that says every American needs to have a primary care doctor there is no intellectual misalignment on the importance of primary care. The problem is that's not where the money is. And so everything has gone towards fragmenting care, more open access, more specialist intervention, more overuse of unnecessary procedures. And it just felt like in order to A, control cost, B, deploy a better member experience, and C, actually do so in a way that is trusted by the average American patient, we need to restore the primacy of primary care. So it all makes good sense and it's still hard to do. I mean, I think about uh, here in Boston, you know, I have a hard time getting a primary care uh, physician. Uh, the most of them want to go into a concierge practice if they're, uh, you know, if they're even available. And then try as they might, they can't necessarily, you know, keep control over the whole uh, rest of the system, which we can talk about in a minute uh, of why it's why it's there. On the other hand, if you look at any countries in the world, you know, we always cite how the U.S. is healthcare is the most expensive and the worst. Uh, the countries that do a good job in terms of quality and in terms of cost, they have strong primary care. So it sort of makes sense to, you know, to be able to have that. But how do you how do you actually get primary care, you know, involved and playing a central role? And then how do you deal with the limitations uh, that they have on their own end about what they can do for quality and cost in the whole system. Yeah, no, David, so all the right questions, um, Boston uh, and your example, which is a good one, again, a very, uh, the kind of place where if somebody has um, a serious brain tumor or their child has an extremely serious condition, you, you, you'd be thrilled to be in Boston because you, you have access to the best of the best, 
But because of that, and because of the incentives and the tilt towards those types of super specialties, um, hasn't invested in sort of the public health access and, and infrastructure. And so Centivo today is not in Boston as one of its native um, network markets, but you know, hopefully uh, someday in the future. But to, but to address your question head on. So what we have found is in order to get going, we, you know, we, we do have to take the world as it exists. We can't sort of take the world as we hope it to be. And so the, the, the closest proxy to having an organized set of entities in the provider landscape that have a proper emphasis on primary care and that are trying to do things the right way, and we'll, we'll, we'll give you some details as to what that means in a moment, is to partner with those organizations who in the late 2000s recognized where the proverbial puck was going and looked at what um, CMS from a Medicare perspective and Medicaid perspective was doing in terms of value-based payments, in terms of reimbursement, and basically said, look, if we're gonna be winners here, the game is going to move away from volume and more towards value. And so what we need to be doing are things like investing in primary care, buying primary care, investing in common EHR platforms so that we have data that is shared by our clinical staff and non-clinical staff, uh, even if people come in through different intake points. Um, we need to take accountability on our provider performance. You know, it, it would have been heresy in the past to say if you, there's a low performing over utilizer of MSK services that we would uh, discipline them or potentially fire them. But these types of organizations said that's where we have to go because that's where the government is pushing the dollars. So our first point of entry is to find markets that are high cost, but have a player that is getting unfairly low traditional commercial market share. And when I say unfairly low, it's because they are doing the right things. They're delivering on the right clinical metrics. They're extremely cost effective. And we basically go to them and say, how do we feature you and do some other things around it? as the centerpiece of a new kind of health plan that's completely dedicated to value-based care. And there's more to it than that, and I'll keep going, but in terms of pausing on this key point, it is impossible to start practice by practice at the primary care level. It is essential to find organized systems, ACOs, that they themselves have recognized the primary care and build from that as the go-to-market strategy. Otherwise, it would take a hundred years and a hundred billion dollars and we'd all have nothing to show for it. Yeah, fair enough. So on the primary care side, it sounds like you're finding, you know, the ACOs, the systems that have emphasized primary care and have done the recruitment and the retention and the training of those primary care physicians. So you've got that somebody else's not problem, but somebody who's, who's made that an emphasis and that's kind of their core competency. So that's a, that's a starting point. That's right. And a good example. So we get asked by employers all the time, we have trouble getting our people into primary care. Traditional networks work with everybody, so they're not able to really help us uh, in this area. What can you do? And a great example is to be able to say, hey, you don't have to believe Centivo. Look at Mount Sinai, our partner in New York. You go to their website. They guarantee same day primary care if you're sick. And, and virtuals obviously uh, put a whole new uh, variable yeah. in this, which we should talk about. But if you're sick and you let them know by 12 noon, you'll get in to see someone by five o'clock. That's something that they themselves have organized to do. We can hold them accountable. We don't have to worry about doing it doctor by doctor. That's the business that they're in. Yeah, you know, I made a list of seven predictions for 2022. And the first one is that the retailers like Walgreens, I think principally, uh, will make consumer uh, make care more consumer friendly. A lot of it has to do with what they're doing going into primary care with you know investments in places like Village MD, and they're kind of addressing the workforce issue I think for primary care as well. Are you finding these ACOs? Are you finding places like Mount Sinai that are doing a good job of recruiting and managing the primary care workforce? Yeah, I think you know it's interesting. There there is a huge variation. Being a primary care clinician is very difficult. Um, folks who go into it relative to other parts of medicine are not necessarily doing it to optimize economics, um, and yet they deal with very complex issues. They're on the front line, and, and uh, the NPs and PAs that are part of primary care practices, um, they're on the front lines of things like social determinants of health, you know, food issues, nutrition issues, access issues. We have clients, we have grocery stores where 
Um, their big issue is access, but access is not about getting into the doctor because they're not available. Access is because they take three buses to get to work and work yeah. two jobs. So um, where I think the organizations have done well, like Mount Sinai, like Memorial Care, our partner in, in, Cal in uh, Long Beach, California, Orange County, et cetera, is that they recognize and give primary care the identity that they're the centerpiece of the system as opposed to an appendage, as opposed to a feeder, you know, for hospital, for surgery, which really is the way that a lot of the other fee-for-service oriented systems think. If you truly embrace value, primary care becomes viewed as the middle of the wheel, uh, as opposed to an appendage. And, and that's pretty critical to identify, recruit and retain, you know, good talent. So, you know, as you know, a lot of, the, and as you said, a lot of the health systems set up primary care to be a fear for these expensive services like uh, radiology and surgery and so on. But how do you deal with that back when they, you know, when the patient sort of gets into that system anyway? So let me, let me ask a question about, for example, um, specialty drugs. So I have a, a relative who has a autoimmune disease and it takes a very expensive drug and the drug is very expensive. It's $3,000 list price. Well, the academic medical center here that, that gives it to them, they charge $27,000 for it, which is a real, it's a real scandal, yeah. you know? So, and uh, Blue Cross pays something like 21,000, 23,000 for that. And then I, I still get stuck with a thousand dollars, you know, as my, as my hit. Now that's a special Boston thing. If you needed one more reason to stay out of Boston, maybe, <laughs> maybe there it is. But how do you, you know, how do you deal with some of these other profit maximizers that are out there and that, you know, primary care, there's only a few percent of the total cost. Great, you expand what they're doing, you have the control over more of it, but but it kind of gets out of control because I think a good primary care physician would put my relative on this drug. Yeah, no, absolutely. So you know, primary care is a, uh, as some might say, it's a necessary but not sufficient condition to control cost. It's important for quality, it's important to build trust, it's important that people not use emergency rooms and urgent cares as sources of primary care, but you need to have more. So I'll give you a couple of examples. So the first is, you know, inevitably the reason why we have health insurance is we will need it for predictable reasons or for unpredictable reasons. And so as we partner with these entities, the primary care piece is critical, but getting really good financials is really critical as well. So in exchange for being a primary feeder for these healthcare systems in terms of um, getting them in front of employers, getting them... Um, you know, their most profitable patients in many ways are those that work for employers as opposed to yeah. Medicare patients, Medicaid patients. So in exchange for building a alternative network, a narrower network um, compared to the traditional models, um, you know, not because we have millions of members, but because we have a attractive strategy for their own businesses, you know, we get attractive rates, typically the best in market um, financial deal. So that helps on things like outpatient services, surgeries, um, imaging, labs, um, hospitals, etc. On areas like specialty pharmacy, frankly, the whole pharmacy category, um, with no sort of claim here of having every answer because these are extremely complicated sort of areas, um, what we do is find best in class partners. So because we're not a carrier uh, we have the ability and we've architected a technology solution to more easily integrate third parties. And so in the area of specialty pharmacy, we specifically work with a company called Vivio, uh, which you may or may not be familiar with, but they you know, really have done a nice job identifying not that that drug uh, is, you know, can we source it for 2,500 bucks versus 3,000 bucks, but just because that drug is FDA approved, does that necessarily mean it's the right one or are, are there alternatives that are a more suitable fit um, for that patient? So really using sort of a uh, utilization management pre-certification model that's driven in based in science to this category of very high end costs. So that's had a great effect in the pharmacy category in general. I'm a big believer and this is again a debate and probably a topic of another uh, podcast, David, but I'm a big believer in the full pass through transparent models. So the minute you take the rebates out and the games out, if someone needs a drug that happens to have a rebate, great, get the drug prescribed, the employer gets the rebate, but the incentives in the system today for the large PBMs to grab a share of rebate and therefore over prescribe on drugs that are not necessary versus lower cost alternatives is, is you use scandal earlier, I will say, you know, near criminal. So yeah. there are a lot of other tools to control cost 
primary care is a key one. Um, the unit cost piece on the facilities, the various pieces on the specialty. Um, and then we have clients who have their own program. So we have a client that believes in international sourcing of high cost drugs. And so we enable that as their administrator. Um, and that's something that we can do on a case by case basis as well. So there are other players that are out there um, pitching to private sector employers that are self-insured, you know, some of smaller and medium sized companies that have gone in the self-insured route. And I'm not saying that you're not different from all of those, but how, how do you kind of array yourself um, against the, the players as you, as you go in and, and are working to develop a, a customer? How, how are you different from someone offering a you know, narrow network or you know, all the various sorts of things that, uh, that people offer these days? Yeah, so, uh, and, and you're right, and there's a lot of fog of war because there's a lot of things that are out there. Um, the predominant, you know, the predominant competitors, if you will, for what we're doing are either narrower network alternatives that are um, birthed by the large carriers, um, or sometimes some of these more, um, you know, aggressive, let's call it uh, reference-based pricing type models where you eliminate the network entirely and move to a payment off a schedule of a percentage of Medicare. So in, in, in those two examples, um, we are able to show materially lower cost savings or more cost savings, sorry, materially lower costs um, and our partners have a track record of really great quality results. So better diabetic control, better hypertension control, lower ER admission, the kinds of things that matter to a commercial population. So usually it is lower cost, better quality, uh, and then we have good satisfaction and 100% client retention, you know, on our core partnership plan product. So um, those are the metrics relative to other narrow networks. Um, yeah. And then relative to some of these sort of non-network models, reference-based pricing models, um, those can save money, but are very hard on members. They create a lot of friction. Um, as, as I like to say, it's all fun and games when you're healthy, but if, yeah. if you're sick and you need a doctor, the last thing you need in between you and your doctor is a lawyer. Um, and that's where a lot of those models tend to go. So the fact that we have fully contracted networks with, again, grade A partners, with Centivo listed on the website as participating insurance, just as Aetna and United yeah. Healthcare are, is a key source of our sale against some of those players. I guess in, in healthcare, specifically as it relates to uh, reference-based uh, pricing, it's, it's, it's all fun and games, and it's all fun and games until someone loses a hundred thousand dollars. That's right. Um, and uh, again, the, the longer conversation in this area, but you know, I think what started as a why would we pay five thousand dollars for an MRI when there are three hundred dollar MRI alternatives in our in our in our zip code? Well, that that makes good sense. Um, but then translating that to can we literally turn a person's individual annual healthcare journey into a series of negotiations of spot contracts? Yeah. That's a pretty miserable way to actually access healthcare. So Ashok, at the, at the beginning of this podcast, we talked a little bit about uh, Western New York, you know, upstate, Buffalo, et cetera. And for some people who are in New York, you know, upstate is sort of like Yonkers or the, or the Bronx or whatever. Rockland so we're, we're County. Talking, yeah. yeah, we're talking considerably further away than that. But, um, you know, why Buffalo as it relates to the, the current business? What, what are sort of the specifics like of there? And I know you have an office in, in New York City as well, but what's the what's the thought? What do you do in Buffalo? What can you achieve? Yeah, that's right. So a lot of our growth is in um, Western New York. About half of our workforce, though, in keeping with a, you know, remote post-pandemic type, uh, you know, economy, you know, about half of our workforce is elsewhere. And some of that is New York. Some of that is uh, in Denver, Colorado, um, Tampa, Florida, as well as literally, you know, scattered. So, you know, we do, re we do, you know, look like a lot of companies our size um, today. But, you know, I think a couple of the reasons for uh, Buffalo, you know, number one, um, you know, we have the advantage of a really good workforce, a really good public education system, a talent pool that includes four uh, local health plans, a national call center, you know, for a large national health plan, a large national TPA that's owned by a carrier, a large insurance company that's not in the healthcare business. So there are a lot of people in this orbit who um, are looking for opportunities to 
really join something new and be part of building a culture and building process and building team and building department and going back to where we started this conversation, really being part of that affordability restoration that, you know, is so desperately needed. You know, whenever we have new hires join, um, and I speak a lot to, you know, college kids or other, you know, entrepreneurs or whatnot, I ask about, you know, how many of you have had a personal experience with someone who could not afford a healthcare bill? And sadly, David, it's everybody. It, it's not yeah. some unique thing. So there's a lot to draw from when we lead with mission. It, it definitely helps. Uh, and to do so and to do so in a, or in, a, in a place like Buffalo that has a great workforce, great people, hardworking, super loyal, very well educated, um, it really is a great combination. Let me uh, ask a final question, which is about if you've had time to do any uh, reading during the last uh, year or two, and if so, if there's anything you would recommend or anything you recommend that we don't waste our time on. <laughs> so um, I, I am lapsed in my fiction. Uh, I, I do enjoy reading fiction. Uh, I've not um, had a good sort of uh, read there in, in some time. Um, but two books uh, that are more in the nonfiction variety, one's a little heavier, one's a little bit lighter that I've read uh, recently. Um, so on the uh, heavier side, um, a book that is a bit of an inspiration for some of what we're trying to do at a high level, um, it was written by two professors, Anne Case and Angus Deaton, called Deaths of Despair. Um, and it's a reminder of how here in America, you know, the richest country in the history of civilization, um, the mortality rate of so many large swaths of the population, specifically sort of the white working class, uh, is at levels that is unseen anywhere else in the world um, except in the developing world. And and it, it is sad. They unpack the reasons why. Um, and it ties to all kinds of issues related to society, related to the connectivity we feel with people, to the transient nature of employment, um, but also to health care. Um, and so that's a sobering read. Um, but Patrick, I was I was going to say I hope that was the heavier that, one because was, otherwise I don't know what the heavier one wants is. That, that, that's a that's a sobering read, but it it, it helps to be grounded on on everything. Um, the lighter read, my my uh, my son is a is a young hockey player. Uh, I'm a big hockey fan, having grown up in uh, in Buffalo. Um, and so the the lighter read is the autobiography of Ken Dryden. Um, the goalie for the Canadians in the 1970s. Uh, the, the book has been updated a couple times. It is about 35 you know, years old or 45 years old at this point, um, but it's a, it's a great read if you're a sports fan, if you're a hockey fan. Some consider it you know, one of the top five you know, sports books of, of all time. It's called The Game um, by, by Ken Dryden. No, that's a good one. My wife is from Montreal, and I have uh, hockey players and uh, now referees, actually. Well, great. Well, Ashok Subramanian, CEO of Centivo, thank you so much for joining me today on the Health Biz Podcast. Appreciate the time, David. Appreciate your interest in the topic and uh, really glad that you're uh, engaging listeners in the way you are. So thank you. You've been listening to the Health Biz Podcast with me, David Williams, president of Health Business Group. I conduct in-depth interviews with leaders in healthcare business and policy. If you like what you hear, go ahead and subscribe on your favorite service. While you're at it, go ahead and subscribe on your second and third favorite services as well. There's more good stuff to come, and you won't want to miss an episode. If your organization is seeking strategy consulting services in healthcare, check out our website, healthbusinessgroup.com.